I have an announcement. I usually start off my videos with a pun, but I have converted to a punism, which is to lack puns. I now hold, in fact, that to speak puns is worthy of grave punishment. So, there have been atheists likely for much longer than there have been records of atheists, and it stands to reason that in any religious society, there will be people who rebel against it, or simply disagree on their own terms. And the same can be said for the Norse. But it seems that across history, atheists manifested in a variety of ways. Now, of course, before going any further, we have to figure out what an atheist is, and there have been a multitude of discussions around this over millennia, and this has never really been controversial before. I'm just kidding. Oh my God, kill me. But there are some attitudes among the Norse in antiquity that reflect this broad discussion. In a modern setting, there are two broad definitions of atheism that you'll find among self-identified atheists. The first one is common within philosophy, being the negation of the proposition that God exists, meaning holding that God and sometimes gods do not exist. The second definition is one that you'll find more within activism circles, which is the lack of a belief that God exists. Now, this is a concept that does not have to include outright denial, but can. Now, this is a definition that encompasses more positions and therefore more people and therefore has political utility in some ways. But it can be applied in a sense of classification to try and include people who do not self-identify as atheists and have no interest in being called atheist, which can cause problems. I've also seen the former definition used in a way to deny that self-identified atheists are in fact atheists. It's, it's a whole thing. That element aside, uh, there is a discussion among atheists about which of these definitions is better for the broader discussion around religion. And it's actually a really interesting topic the deeper you get into it. But for our purposes of understanding whether or not there were atheist Vikings, we can look at these examples in history through both lenses. Now, there have been other conceptions of atheism in history. Christians were at one point considered atheists by the Romans because they deny the gods. Now, Obviously, in the modern day, we don't see Christians as atheists. We see them as monotheists or, or whatever you consider the Trinity. But from a polytheist perspective, the difference between one God and none is small when the default in society is many. And from the Roman perspective, the amount of gods denied by Christians and atheists had a difference of one. And when compared to those who follow many gods, the difference of one isn't substantive. Of the examples of potential atheists that we have in the Norse sagas, we have a character who makes what's probably the most explicit statement named Kettle, who achieved the nickname Kettle Trout, or possibly Kettle Salmon. I've seen both translations. His saga is really short. It's roughly 30 pages or so. And in it, he goes on a number of adventures, all very briefly described. Reading Kettle's saga has a sense of whiplash about it. One second, he's fighting a dragon with a salmon tail in what's described as a very manly way with an ax. And the next second, he's in the deep north, facing encounters with the Sami. And somewhere along the way, he even gains a magical sword. Now, Kettle's a good guy, but he got himself into a bit of trouble on a semi-regular basis because he swore an oath that he wouldn't force his daughter to marry anyone. And when a request for marriage would come, he would ask her if she was interested. If she said no... This would be taken as an offense, and the suitor would then challenge Kettle to a duel, at which point he'd kill them, aided, of course, by his magic sword. This happened with a heathen berserker king named Freimar, and the same deal happens. He asks for his daughter's hand in marriage. He says he'll ask her. She says no. Kettle tells him this, and he's mad, and he wants to fight about it. And if you can imagine Kettle just sighing and realizing he has to kill another presumptive man who just thinks he has immediate rights to his daughter... But this time it's a berserker. When your progressive notions of consent wind up in having to uh, stab multiple people. <laughs> History is a mess. Whatever the case, Kettle befriends the berserker king's son, who warns him of the man's blessings from Odin in his youth, that it seems no sword can cut him. Kettle becomes angered at the mere mention of Odin, saying, I never gave sacrifice to Odin, and yet I have lived long. He swears knowledge that Framar will fall and brings his trusty blade to the fight. And through a lengthy duel, the Berserker King withstands several direct hits from his magical sword. And yet Kettle repeats his faith in the luck contained within his blade, and he fights on. 
and eventually the sword's metal bites his opponent, and he slays the berserker there. Bite is an interesting word to use for, like, the sword catching, I guess. I I don't know. It, the saga uses the word bite. I don't think that means that the sword has, like, teeth or something like that. I don't think it means that. It could. The saga records that Freimar's son then asks Kettle to marry his daughter. And it appears that she consented, and Kettle finally didn't have to kill anyone else. So, is Kettle an atheist? You could say that he is one within the story, though granted he only specifies Odin. He might differ from some modern atheists, given that his story is surrounded by magical events, dragons, magic swords, people can control the weather, and shapeshift into whales. But when it comes to at least Odin specifically, it appears that he takes a stance of rejection and believes only in his own luck, wit, and strength. And his magic sword, you know, that's pretty cool. Now, it's clear that men like this existed. The sagas record many of them, but there are questions around the number of people like this within the sagas, as they appear overrepresented. Now, there's no denial of atheism existing in history. Going back to the Roman Empire, we see an extensive discussion from Plutarch comparing atheism, which he records as meaning disbelief, with superstition, which he defines as the dread of the gods. Plutarch seems to address an existing notion around atheism, that it's essentially impiety and a rejection, even scoffing, of tradition. He discusses an active denial of the gods, but he seems far more concerned with behavior rather than the simple rejection, which he describes as mostly harmless. He points instead to the atheist's proclivity to mock with laughter during religious practices such as prayer, banquets, or festivals, saying that they would call it silly to think that these actions actually honor the gods, which... Sounds a little bit familiar, doesn't it? But he records that no harm is really done by atheism other than this, whereas superstition he regards as the greater issue, not least because it sometimes kills people. Plutarch draws an interesting analogy, asking which you think that he might prefer, someone who says that Plutarch doesn't exist, or someone who says that Plutarch is an inconsistent, fickle person, quick-tempered, vindictive over little accidents, pained at trifles. If you invite others to dinner and leave him out, or if you haven't the time to go call on him, or you fail to speak to him when you see him, he will set his teeth into your body and bite it through, or he will get a hold of your little child and beat him to death, or he will turn the beast that he owns onto your crops and spoil your harvest. Which of these would you prefer? He goes more into this, but he basically says that superstition is worse, even more impious, because it's a position of such debilitating fear of the gods. He observes that the superstitious man essentially wishes that he could be an atheist, but is too weak to do so. And he says this quite plainly, saying, the atheist believes that there are no gods. The superstitious man wishes there were none, but believes against his will. Now, interestingly... He points to the cause of atheism as superstition, that where atheism exists, superstition gives it reason, because it provides the ridiculousness for atheists to point to and justify themselves, which brings to mind atheism as justified by creationism and the harmful ridiculousness that often comes from extremism in Christianity, which also, interestingly, the main criticism of Christianity from Pliny the Younger, a Roman governor and author, was that he considered it to be extremely superstitious. These conversations seem to change so much and yet so little. So let's consider the Christian authorship of the sagas with this backdrop. Why would atheists such as Kettle be overrepresented? Was it because there were several atheists among ancient heathens? Likely not, though they certainly existed. It does seem in some cases, however, heathens were recast as atheists, so that Christians could write about them as celebrated heroes. A rather overt example of this is Hrolf Kraki, a semi-legendary Danish king who is very obviously recast as an atheist, and it even appears that his story was significantly changed. He is surrounded by berserkers, he fights magical beasts and the undead, attains the assistance of a werebear, and even meets Odin. The story is so obviously about a heathen hero that it seems that the text overcorrects as it lectures Hrolf Kraki for not being a Christian despite never having access to Christianity. But an important note about Hrolf Kraki is that the main villain of the story is King Adels of Sweden, who is a frere-worshipping heathen with a giant pet boar, 
who had demonstrated several unsavory characteristics. Now, the scribes of this story likely took this as an opportunity to cast the pagan as the villain in a story with a hero and strip that hero of his religion so that he could justifiably be celebrated within a Christian record. Now, that way we have the atheist king versus the religious demon-worshipping heathen king in which that demon worshiper is defeated by someone who is unwittingly fighting for Christ, even though he's an atheist. It would be quite interesting to take a look at whatever sources the scribe was using to record this story, to know what was changed and what wasn't. But let's be honest, the story is still pretty cool as is, and any story that contains werebears is worth reading at least once. But this recasting probably reflects Plutarch's preferences when it comes to atheism versus superstition. As to the Christian, the heathen is the superstitious one, albeit a different understanding of superstition, being labeled as, as demon worship. There's an interesting ebb and flow throughout history over which is actually preferable, the heathen or the atheist. And it seems largely dependent on which one is, at the time, perceived as the bigger threat to Christianity. In times like when the saga of Trofklaki was recorded, the atheist was the preferable one because pagans were lurking around the corner. Ooh. And at least the atheist doesn't worship demons. But as atheism gains a foothold, suddenly the image is that the pagan is preferable because at least they believe in something, right? But there are some men who likely were atheists, even explicitly saying so, mentioned in other sagas. And while these accounts may or may not reflect actual events, they are a window into how such men may have thought. In fact, some men were even named the godless to denote that they sacrificed to no god, Christian or otherwise. And this would be something that might denote something similar to modern atheism. And some had more explicit dialogue within the sagas, such as a man named Barth the Stout, who was sought as an ally by Olaf I of Norway. The messenger, before he travels to see this man, asks what is known of Barth's religion. And Olaf simply says that he doesn't know, but he hasn't converted, and no temples exist within his lands. When the messenger arrives, Barth says explicitly to the messenger that he is well-traveled, that he has seen much, and that because of this, he placed no faith in any fiend nor carved image, and he instead places his faith in his own might, a faith shattered by a wrestling match with the messenger, and Barth goes on to convert to Christianity and join Olaf's alliance. More of these godless men are mentioned in the Heimskringla, Snorri's record of the kings of Norway. Saint Olaf II was a Christian king that fought many battles, He's also the king that's present in the, the tale of the Volsi, which is a very different story to this one, but that's very much a different video. Uh, while his army was marching, he met two highwaymen with a band of about 30 soldiers willing to join his ranks, and Olaf asked if they were Christians. And the men gave an answer that might frustrate some people lately, that they were neither Christian nor heathen, but follow no gods. They and their band of men only believed in their own power and success, meaning their strength and their luck and that in their experience, this had proved well enough. St. Olaf would urge these men to convert, and when they refused, he told them to leave. And these highwaymen felt that this was a disgrace to their honor. No one had ever refused their support before. And they and their band continued to follow St. Olaf's army at a distance, and when it came time to fight the battle, they again offered their help. Olaf accepted the men, but only if they became baptized as he had previously just ordered several hundred heathen men in his army to go home because they had refused baptism moments before. The godless ones consulted with one another and said that they would rather fight on the side of the king simply because he needed the help more, greater risk for greater glory. And so they agreed to convert just so that they could fight in the battle, believing the conversion to be of little consequence. And they died fighting shortly thereafter. There was another man with a similar background uh, who approached St. Olaf to join his army. And Olaf would ask, are you a Christian? And the man responded that he believed in nothing but his own strength, and that until now this had served him well. But that now he felt that he was meant to believe in King Olaf, and that he didn't know who Christ was or where he lived. But since the king wanted him to believe, 
so he would. He too would die in the very same battle. Now, obviously these men converted within their stories, but they seem to be the ones that most fit within the modern ideas of atheism. But the specifics are obviously lost. We can't interview them. We can only go on their words recorded over a century later by various scribes. However, these stories do give us a window into what the godless men might have been like and what their justifications might have been. It's entirely possible that the godless ones were men that believed that the gods existed, but didn't sacrifice to them or resented them in some way. They instead would have preferred to put their trust in their own abilities, in spite of the gods existing and taking part in the lives of others. Now, holding that the gods exist, and yet not giving sacrifice to them or not having a practice related to them, might not be what modern atheists consider atheism, but it would in effect be very similar. Though it's important to keep in mind that the godless ones might have rejected the existence of the gods or otherwise didn't believe, bringing them more in line with modern atheism. Now, Plutarch associates atheism in his time with a rejection of tradition and culture, and there seems to be a similarity with the men mentioned. They are often travelers, highwaymen, outlaws, people who are uprooted out of their society in some way, and therefore broken with the traditions of their home. And their suggestion that some with this background may have had a close association with Odin. During the reign of Harald Fairhair, for example, many people were uprooted out of their homes during the conflict and forced to wander alone or join bands of Vikings. These bands would have been made up of people from various backgrounds, and their religion and traditions would have therefore also been varied. But in practicing together, They likely evolved their own traditions, and it seems that Odin was a popular deity with these wandering bands. And it may be from these people that we have the Havamal, wanderers, rejecting tradition, exploring, some heathens, some godless, but all the same depending on each other, leaning into their might, their luck, and strength. The difference between these atheists, or godless ones in these bands, And the atheists observed by Plutarch is that these people likely realize that, religious or not, they have to depend on each other. There's little room for mockery when there is food to find, or a battle to fight. So instead, they stand together and support one another, so that they can see the next day. Well, uh, I hope you all enjoyed this one. Uh, As usual, a video that I thought would be simpler than it was resulted in hunting down a ton of sources. But uh, I had a lot of fun finding this information as well as sharing it with you. So let me know what y'all think of the Godless Ones. I found them absolutely fascinating. And hail to my patrons for making this content possible. It's good to have people at your back. Be sure to like, subscribe, and strike the bell with your personal might. May it serve you well. And remember to find a way or make one.